Welcome to We Are SC Game Day. This is Eric McKinney, joined by Greg Katz. Greg, we're going to try this. Uh, 2019 season, it kicks off today. I mean, it feels like it has been ages since USC has taken the field. Uh, we have kickoff tonight, 7.30 p.m., Fresno State comes to the Coliseum. A and really, it's Fresno State. It, it could be anybody because this game is all about USC. It's about how they bounce back from five and seven. That is what people want to see. That's what I want to see. I know that that's what you want to see. Clay Helton, the USC Trojans, we, we want to see how this thing goes. Quickly, your take on what the season opener sort of means to you uh, in, in terms of the 2019 season. Well, it's kind of like spring. Spring is like renewal. And uh, whatever starts, uh, we're going to find out. We've, we're, we're done with questions. We're done with debating. We're done with the civil infighting. Uh, I had my bagel and cream cheese this morning, a tradition for me, for the first game of the season. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. I think there's an excitement uh, level that will build. The fact the game's at 730 adds just a little bit more intensity to it. Uh, hopefully it's a comfortable day. It seems to be a comfortable day out there. And, uh, you know, by the time kickoff, uh, I checked, it says 77 degrees. And, uh, you know, it'd still be a little bit light. So that, that's, that's cool. And, um, hey, the new press box, everything, fans. The only thing we got to see is how are the Trojans going to play? If they win and don't look good, that's not a good sign. But if they win and they look good doing it, it could get very exciting. Look, let, let's go back through it. I mean, again, it, it's the season opener, so what we have to really talk about that has happened ha has been sort of a wild offseason. You, you had the five and seven year. Cliff Kingsbury was going to come in and fix everything. He was here for, I think it was 34 days, just a little bit over a month. Uh, obviously, <laughs> just didn't end up being the answer. He goes to Arizona. But that looked like sort of the big splash hire that you were going to make. Graham Harrell ends up being the guy, and it's sort of a, a rebound. It's another Texas Tech quarterback, another air raid guy. He certainly came in and, and talked the talk, and so far they've walked the walk. Again, this is just – we're talking spring ball, we're talking summer PRPs, and we're talking fall camp. But I, I am excited about this offense, and I loved USC's sort of tailback, running back, central, centric – uh, offenses, uh, you know, power football, all that stuff. I, I know a lot of USC fans love all of that. I am so curious to see how this offense works. And, and again, when you're talking about there being a pon an opponent tonight, I, I want to see the offense. I, I think so many eyes are going to be on how does this work? Uh, is this something that USC can run? Because on paper, you look at those wide receivers. You look at the, you know, the potential of J.C. Daniels. You look at the, the running backs that are back there. And, and Graham Harrell said it. A lot of the players said it. You just haven't seen this kind of offense run with this sort of four- and five-star talent. I, I want to see how it works. Personally, I, I think we could see some growing pains early. But, but I think it's going to be good. I, I think it's going to be a, a pretty dynamic offense. And, and I'm excited to see the wide receivers really sort of get loose uh, and, and work against a Fresno State secondary that has some guys but is not deep. Well, you know, there's so many questions and there's so many ways, directions it could go. Number one, uh, they haven't played against anybody else's defense. And some their defense hasn't gone against somebody else's offense. But, but the idea about the offense is, I agree that, uh, you know, with skilled players, this could be a real different sort of looking, uh, you know, air raid. On the other hand, it's not like the air raid, nobody's seen it. I mean, the Mountain West Conference sees it, you know, so it's not going to be any shock. The only shock value, and I agree with Graham Harrell, is the ex you have to execute. He's got players to execute. And really what we don't know is this, this lingering, numbing feeling I have about the offensive line and the ability to run the football. Uh, no matter how I slice it, how I dice it, you know, uh, if it's going to be a bunch of five and out patterns and then some crossing patterns and some deep seam patterns and then get stone trying to run the ball, you know, really SC could make itself one dimensional. And that's not a good thing. So I'm interested about seeing how Graham Harrell calls the game, how he calls the game. Uh, I, I will be honest with you with all due respect to the previous play callers. 
uh, it's got to be a massive improvement. At least the guy knows it's his offense. He's going to run what he thinks is right. And uh, I, I think all Trojan fans should be open-minded. But for many of us that are of the older generation, uh, even if, uh, you know, you're not into tailback, you, per se, if you look at the real powerhouse teams in, in college football, Alabama, Ohio State, the one thing we know, and we know it firsthand, is those offensive lines are physical and they can run the ball as well as spread the field. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, SC is in that direction. I'll give Helton a lot of credit. He's, he's thrown it all on uh, Harrell, really, to, you know, to make, to make a difference. And uh, we just don't know what's really going to happen until we watch it happen. No, I think there was a there, there's so much of that we just don't know. And, and you look back at coming off a five and seven season, there was this real dip, especially after that Kingsbury, whatever you want to call it, fiasco, I guess. Uh, but but during spring ball, you saw some signs of life, and, and there really was sort of momentum picked up. I, I guess as much momentum as you can gain after that kind of season. I mean, it's not nobody was coming in thinking, okay you know, USC's challenging Clemson and Alabama and some of those schools. But players were saying the right things. Aaron Osmus is, you know, his hire as the strength and conditioning coach, again, a, a hire that was met with kind of some, some questions. How will this work out? But he seems to have really kind of hit it off with the players. They, they bought into what he's brought. And, and the players are all, again, saying the right things. You, you like to hear what they're saying. They feel like they have momentum. They feel some confidence coming into this year, but you have to see it. I mean, uh, there, there's no way they went into last year thinking, well, we're going to go five and seven this year. So again, there's so much to prove for this team. And like you said, I think it really does start up on the offensive line. The depth chart was released yesterday. That This is a new, uh, it's going to be a Clay Helton tradition for this whole season. We're not going to know the USC depth chart until Friday it seems like maybe late morning now based on what happened yesterday. The The one question I think going in was what would the offensive line look like? You had a returning starter in right guard, Andrew Voorhees, but we saw enough this fall where grad transfer Drew Richmond, who came over from Tennessee, he started sliding in there at that starting right tackle spot. And then Jalen McKenzie would slide over to right guard. That's the way it wound up going uh, on this initial depth chart. Curious about, from you, what you saw and, and what you think about that move? Well, I thought the move was uh, a, a really good move, although I thought it was inevitable. Uh, I mean, uh, you don't get a grad transfer that started in the SEC, albeit there wasn't one of the better lines of, you know, in the SEC, Tennessee kind of really uh, sucked, if you really want to know. But, you know, he could be an improvement. One of the keys is he's going to try to show the NFL that he can play at that level, so he's motivated. I think moving uh, McKenzie over, and I, I have a great deal of respect for McKenzie because he's re reconfigured his body. He's uh, obviously comes from a family football background. And I think this could be a great spot for him. And I, I, I'm curious to see as the season unfolds, if that's the physical part of the line that we've been waiting to see. Yeah, I, I think that was the question, the right side. Once Elijah Vera Tucker sort of slid in at that left guard spot, really, or, I mean, the, the first day of spring ball, that left side was, was stabilized, at, you know, with, with Austin Jackson there at left tackle, Vera Tucker at left guard, and then Brett Nealon at center. The right side was the one where you kind of had some questions because, again, Chuma Doga left, uh, for, you know, to, to the NFL, went, went off to the NFL. So you had a spot at right tackle. And Jalen McKenzie, the, the thought was maybe he's a better guard than a tackle, and that's what we end up seeing. I, I think watching how the right side of the offensive line does uh, in this season opener is going to give you sort of a, a lot of a, a sense of what the offensive line is going to look like throughout. I, I think this is something where a lot of people and really, you know, everybody, when they talk about the first game, it's, hey, that's a start. And then you build and you build and you build. I, I think this first game is going to give us a real sense of what this offensive line is. If they come out and they're pushed around by what is going to be in terms of the Fresno State defense, their best unit is up front, specifically right in the middle of defensive tackles. So Fresno State up front is not going to get pushed around by anybody this year. USC, I think, as they're with their offensive line, needs to come out 
and make a statement early. Again, we talked about the wide receivers, the running backs just kind of going everywhere. It's got to start up front because Stanford is right around the corner. And then you've got Utah, Washington, Notre Dame, that, those three. And we'll talk about those over the next few weeks. Uh, but, but you need that offensive line to take a big step forward, I think, in this first game. Well, we don't know is we don't know how good the SC off defensive line was when they went up against the offensive line. You know, we went through this last year. You know, it's going to be a great defense. They're not going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to control everything. And obviously, at the end of the season, uh, they weren't controlling anything. Uh, so I don't know. I think the first game, for me, I'm going to be looking at the physicality. I know people are sick of hearing the word physicality. I'm sure the players are sick of it. But, you know, it really gets right down to, making comparisons between Ohio State, Notre Dame, you know, Alabama. I'm not expecting them to be that. But I think this is the five best linemen that they have. I don't think there's a silver bullet waiting in the wings. There's no five-star true freshman that's going to move into anything. Uh, you know, they're, you know, I'm sure Tim Drevno, the offensive line coach, he could tinker with a few other things. Maybe, you know, you got uh, Dietrich at center. Maybe he tries guard a little bit. But I think what you see is what you're going to get. So hopefully, number one, they're physical. Yeah, I mean, I think the offensive line is, is really the key, and that's really the only position that's worth talking about in terms of what could happen. The, the wide receivers, Michael Pittman, Tyler, I mean, do you have 20 minutes? Michael Pittman, Tyler Bonds, Amon Ross St. Brown, what we saw from Devin Williams in flashes during the spring and the fall. And then you've got, you know, Valus Jones, I thought, this fall for not participating uh, in the spring, for coming back, in the fall, I, I thought he was outstanding in this offense. And then the three true freshmen who absolutely will see time tonight, uh, John Jackson the third, which that, you know, a phenomenal story. I think everybody uh, in the stadium is rooting hard for him. Get that first catch, maybe that first touchdown right off the bat here. And then Drake London and Maneer McLean. These are three true freshmen you're going to hear a lot all season. Again, it, it sounds silly because those top four, top five wide receivers are so good. But this offense relies on a lot of wide receivers. So you're going to see those guys a lot. And then at running back, you have Vavai Malapai, Stephen Carr, Marquis Stepp. All three of those guys could be starters at USC. All three of them are probably going to get a lot of touches. So the quarterback is going to get a lot of help from all of those guys. And I know, I'm going to, I, I, know I took a lot of the skill guys. I'm going to let you talk a little bit about what you've seen from some of those guys outside. Well, you know, it's going to be a question of credibility because – They've all been told that they're going to all play a lot. So we're going to see tonight if they're all going to play a lot. And they're, they're going to go by what the coaches told them. So, you know, it makes no difference to me whether, I mean, I would, I'd rather not see them drop a ball. But you know what? they got to get in there. That's the only way you can get experience for the young kids. I don't see a team in the conference or that many in America that could stack up depth-wise for the quality. You know, there's no denying it. There's NFL guys all over the place. Uh, I'm not saying any one particular one's a first-round draft pick shoe-in, but there's enough of them. And I think the running backs, as you said, I agree totally. They could start for most teams in the Pac-12. What SC has to be very careful about is because of recruiting, they've got to make sure when they have a running back uh, game that they actually have a running back game. Because if they don't, if they, if these running backs all sit there and don't do anything other than catch a pass, you know, the bottom line will be. There's kids watching in the stands to say, well, if I go to SC, I'm just going to be a pass catcher. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, running backs want to run the ball. So uh, it's going to make for an interesting question. Yeah, and then we've talked a ton about the offense without getting into the quarterback. JT Daniels uh, named the starter towards the end of camp. Uh, Keaton Slovis, the true freshman, number two. Matt Fink, number three. Jack Sears, number four. Jack Sears eventually decides he's going to enter the transfer portal, which he'll – choose a new school at the end of December once he graduates from USC. But so right now you've got two really young kids. I mean, JT Daniels, there's been so much talk about him and, and, you know, discussion over his play last year. It feels like he's been here for about four years now, but this is a true sophomore that skipped his senior year of high school. I mean, still, even with 11 starts last year, not a ton of experience, you know, at the college level. But he's going to get the start. I think that he's so much more comfortable in this offense. You, you talked about the offense last year. And I, I think the offense last year, I think the USC defense knew that the offense didn't really know what was going on. I think everybody in the offense knew. I, I think it affected 
so much beyond just the actual offensive play. I, I think that that had a real negative effect on maybe the entire program, at, you know, anybody affiliated with it. So I think the offense taking the field here, knowing this is what we do, this is what we do well, and knowing they have this offensive coordinator now in Graham Harrell that knows this offense inside and out, and, and he knows how to use it. And, and so I think that gives JT Daniels a huge step up this year. We're going to see what happens. He, he's going to have to deal with however the offensive line, you know, winds up performing. Uh, and, and he's still not going to, you know, escape the pocket like some of these, you know, uh, Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks of late. Um, but, but he does have the support and he did seem to develop, you know, that chemistry with these wide receivers during the fall. So a, as much as I'm interested in watching how the offensive line performs, JT Daniels could make a big statement tonight uh, with how he plays. I think he has to. I think when we talk about a lot of questions about the offensive line, I think there's a lot of questions about JT Daniels. He's no longer the Gatorade player of the year. He's no longer the golden child for a modern day. He's a sophomore quarterback starting at SC and was named that. Uh, he deserved to be it. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is, uh, if Jack Sears was still on the team, uh, you know, who knows? You know, people will be calling for Sears. But, of course, we know that Jack was four-string. But you got Keaton Slovis. I think it was a real, real roll of the dice by Helton and the Herald to name Slovis. Not that I don't think Slovis can be good. I do think he can be good. But you got to remember what the team thinks. You know, the team is probably going, okay, uh-huh. You know, we like Jack and what have you. If I'm a senior, uh, I, I want to see wins. I don't want to see experimentation with a backup quarterback coming in if JT, you know, gets hurt or has to come out. The thing about JT is I don't think it's any secret. People question his manliness in the pocket, for lack of a better word. Uh, that may not be true. Uh, he may be as tough as nails, but there is that sense that maybe he doesn't like to get whacked around, and we all know he doesn't have the escapability of, let's just say, think, okay? And, uh, you know, against Fresno State, we'll see. I, I hope for JT, really, that part of the growth process is that he grows into, okay, if they hit me, they hit me, and, uh, but where did the ball land? And that's important to me because not only uh, does he have to prove it to himself, he really has to prove it to his teammates that he's a tough hombre just like the rest of them. Uh, you know, he'll throw the pass. We'll see. I, I, when, you know, we talk about what was I looking for, the offensive line, you know, the physicality. I want to see, I want to see leadership, and that comes in the form of I can take a hint and uh, I'm not afraid to get out of the pocket. And we'll see. You know, I still think the jury's out. So the offense is definitely going to be something to watch, where, where the jury's kind of out on, on every spot, because you do have a lot of potential almost everywhere, but we're going to see what the production looks like against Fresno State. Flipping over to defense, I think it's the same kind of thing. You look at the defensive line, and it's like, wow, there is a ton of talent there. Let's see what happens because there was a ton of talent there last year and things didn't quite come together. I think the new defensive line coach, Chad Koha'aha, I, I think he was a... Congratulations on that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think he was a, a huge addition. He seemed to really click with those guys up front. He talks about playing across the line of scrimmage. He talks about gap integrity. He, you could tell early in spring that he took a look back at some of that film last year and he was going, uh-uh. This, this is not how we're doing things. And he really sort of tightened things up. And you heard a lot from those defensive linemen saying, this is what we needed. We, you know, we, we really are, are taking to this. And I'm excited to watch that defensive front. I'm going to steal him before you can get to him. Drake Jackson's going to be one of those guys. I, I have a feeling he's going to do something tonight where everyone's going to go, okay, that's what they were talking about. And, and I hope, because we certainly have talked about him enough, but you have a senior like Christian Rector back, and then those guys in the middle, Jay Tufele, Marlon Tui Pelotu, Brandon Feely, there are a lot of guys up there, and they really need to make plays against the Fresno State offensive line that, again, has a couple good players in there, probably an NFL guy uh, at left guard, uh, a returning starter at right tackle. But this is a D an offensive line that you need to go up against and make a statement against if you're USC. Well, I think, you know, the interesting part is that Fresno only returns two starters, and, uh, but they run a program and they have a system. And you can't dismiss that when 
you have a coach that knows the system and he's been in it now for what is this gonna be his third year fourth year you know they've won and they got they keep getting better so by this time he's stalking that system redshirting guys uh and you know tedford has never won in the coliseum he's 0 and six but he's always been competitive for the most part and this is something that uh you know you can't you can't downplay i think the key here is when i look at the sc defensive line now and I see Coach K coaching him, I envision a Utah defensive line. That's what I expect to see, okay? And I think that they're aggressive. I don't know if they're so fast coming out of, the, out of their stance, but they are aggressive. I think they're going to be better coached, better technique, which is going to make a big difference. And if, uh, you know, any one of those guys can get to – Drake Jackson, is, he's, the, he's the real deal. I don't often say somebody's a real deal, but you know something. He, he's gonna he's gonna make a few mistakes. He's gonna be wide eyed, but like you say, it's gonna be hard to keep your eye off of him uh, when he when he's on coming off the edge because he made a lot of plays in spring ball, intercepting a pass. You know he he's a he's a ball player, and a guy like that can make a huge difference on a defensive line, even as a young true freshman. Yeah, and another guy who's a ball player for me. Talano Hafunga at, at the safety spot. Again, we got glimpses of him last year before he had the injury, uh, the, the broken collarbone. I think this kid is special. I, I'm, you know, he's a true sophomore without a ton of experience, and I'm not going to throw around Troy Polamalu comparisons to a lot of people. I think he this year could start giving you those glimpses that remind you of Troy. Maybe not as fast just in terms of straight line speed, but – Boy, he is around the ball a lot, and he just sort of has that energy and enthusiasm when he's out there on the field. But this is a very young secondary, and I think you're looking at some corners that are probably going to get tested by Fresno State, even though they're bringing in a quarterback with, with almost no experience. Well, I think the bad news is, is they're inexperienced at the corners. They're extremely young. But the good news is, look who they practice against. I mean, they're practicing against one of the best uh, wide receiver units in the country. I don't know many teams are going to have that amount and depth of wide receiver talent. So we may be looking at a, a, a secondary that looks not as good as it really is in practice because they won't be facing these type of receivers in a regular game. And uh, I will say this, uh, it's going to be all about making sure you don't have uh, broken coverages. Did you stay in your right technique? I think Greg Burns, a new, First-year defensive uh, back coach has done a good job with them. I think he understands them. I think they, uh, you know, coaching-wise, I think just uh, as an overall blanket on it all, I think there's a far better coach team than we've seen under Clay Helton. Uh, you know, a lot of times, like a Sam Darnold disguises, you know, some real big mistakes and technical issues. But, you know, I like what I see. Um, you know, it's going to be a question of that front, they put the pressure on. It'll help the secondary a lot. My key on, on Talanoa, Ufunga, is, you know, some guys, they hit so hard, they actually hurt themselves. And, you know, that was one of the things about Paul Amalu is he hit so hard, but he never seemed to get hurt himself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that not a lot of players can do that. So it's going to be interesting to see how that shoulder holds up as the season progresses. Yeah, again, I think this Fresno State team probably gives you defensively a, a really good picture of where you are. Jeff Tedford, the things he does, he does well as a coach and what he can get his offense to do. There's a tight end there that could give teams fits. USC is going to have to be sound against him. And you know he's going to use formations. He's going to try to trick that you know young secondary They're going to be ready to go. So USC, again, they're going to need to be buttoned up against this Fresno State team. Talent-wise, no, this is, this is not a game. I, I think I've said it before. Fresno State is, is like a four-seam fastball down the middle. This is a team that USC, if they're going to take that step forward, if they're going to be a good team this year, this is a Fresno State team that USC should be able to handle. If they are not ready, if they were unprepared, this is a Fresno State team that could embarrass you by running right past you. So well, for me, that's what I want to see. I want to see USC come out turn the page from last year, and take care of business. Well, I think we only have to bring up uh, two previous teams, UNLV and Western Michigan, to say, are we going to overlook the, – th these are much – this team, this program 
is much better than UNLV and Western Michigan. Yes. So if they take that same outlook, which I don't think they will, and certainly hope that they won't, you know, they'll be in a game. I think the Trojans have to start off fast. I think they have to score. And I think they have to put their foot on the accelerator and pretend they're playing UCLA for four quarters because I think it's important for their own self-esteem because we know, as you've mentioned, uh, you know, tonight is the last, if you want to say, uh, exhibition scrimmage without, with all due respect to Fresno. I mean, after Fresno, it's like, you know, the, you just look at the odds makers. Uh, they're going to tell you all you need to know. We should touch on special teams uh, briefly if we could. I'm looking forward to, to Ben Griffith's kicking tonight. I think that that's going to be exciting. And I think McGrath coming back uh, from his leg injury is look good in practice. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll agree with you there. But uh, again, let's fast forward to tonight. I, I want to get to this game. I want to get this season started because I'm very curious about how USC starts off this season. Because again, like you said, the competition t dials up to 11 right after this game. It, it gets tougher. So we'll see how it goes. For Greg Katz, this is Eric McKinney. Thanks for watching. We are SC. Eric McKinney here now with Daryl Rodeau. Daryl, 2019 season. We're here. We made it. Uh, opening day, opening night tonight, USC, Fresno State. Take me through a little bit. What, what does it, it mean, that first game of the season? What, what does it do to you? How do you sort of get prepared for it? And, and even as a veteran guy, how, what does it what does it mean to get out there on the Coliseum again? And really, how do you feel that first day of a season? Well, for this particular team in 2019, it's unlike no other that anyone on this coaching staff or these players might have experienced, with the exception of perhaps Greg Burns. And the reason why I say that is because there's been so many changes from the coaches, how they're going to interact, the communication coming back and forth from the Coliseum um, down onto the field. But for the players, a lot, as much as Clay Heldon tries to simulate game-like scenarios, there is no substitute for the experience of being out there in the Coliseum when it's loud, 70,000 plus, you know, and unveiling a new stadium. But I recall being in the hotel the night before, unable to sleep because it wasn't quite my bed. You know, the, the pregame jitters, rehearsing all of my plays, making sure I understood terminology, adjustments, things that we wanted to do. Going into what we, we considered uh, pregame preparation, clap session. Wanting to make sure that I was crisp and sharp. It's those things, Eric, that, that you can't simulate, you just have to go through it. But when they get onto the field, it's calming that heart rate down, slowing the body down because you, you're gonna be jacked up and juiced, especially for players that have, have only experienced the Coliseum from the stands. Now they're on the field, slowing the body down, getting those dead legs out so that when they get on the field, they're at peak form. It takes about a quarter to really adjust, and it takes that first hit to get those jitters out. And we've seen that. Uh, again, this is USC's first day. We've seen a ton of games, and I think calling them sloppy would be, yeah. you know, maybe praise for them. Uh, a lot of missed tackles, missed assignments, penalties. Why is that in the, in the first game? And this is something we've seen from USC really the past two years, that first game, teams have come into the Coliseum, Western Michigan and UNLV, yep. and, and really kind of run all over them through missed tackles. Right. What, what is it about that that first game? We heard Christian Rector talk a little bit this week about yeah. those are first game mistakes, yeah. uh, missed gap assignments and, and missed tackles. Right, and when you talk about going into uh, the first game, you have to think about what happens during camp. Camp is simulated and it's scripted. So it's a controlled tempo and a controlled chaos. But when you get onto the field and live bullets occur, the speed and the tempo increases and it magnifies. And because of that, perhaps the angle that you were taking in practice is slower than the, the degree that you have to come downhill with. So for many of the players, when I talked about controlling your heart rate and your tempo, but it's also making sure that you're in proper alignment and assignment because if you anticipate that things are gonna occur like they did in practice, wrong answer. This is a team in Fresno State that is trying to prove that they belong in the same field as USC. So they're gonna to try to take the fight to the Trojans. And as a result of that, oftentimes what you see is poor mechanics, fundamentals break down when guys get fatigued early in the game. But expect this particular team, based on how USC has changed up their tempo in practice, going a lot of um, two minute drills to try to really simulate being tired at the beginning of practice and having to adjust, I expect much of the same. This coaching staff accumulated by Clay Heldon offensively and defensively 
is not only looking at preparing the, the players physically, but mentally preparing them to embrace those situations so that they can avoid those errors in assignments. Now, one guy who is familiar with USC coming into the Coliseum, Jeff Tedford, not a ton yeah. of success uh, at the Coliseum, but, but certainly responsible for one of the you know, biggest Pac-10 wins right. over USC uh, back in 2003. What, what does he do for a team? We, we've seen him take over a Fresno State team that was 1-11 and yeah. terrible. And, and Fresno State was the best team in California last year. That, that was a quick turnaround, two yeah. years turnaround. This is his third year. A lot of new players, but what do you expect from a, a Jeff Tedford-led team? Well, I, going back to the time that I played from 1999 to 2002 was epic battles against Jeff Tepper. And why? Because he seems to understand what your weaknesses are. He's a master at preparation, going back 12 games, as much as 24, 36 games deep, and looking for tendencies. And what he looks for is your bad habits. He's one who will set you up. Perhaps there's early on you'll see a play action pass and the quarterback kind of flares out. Well, on the back side of that play, he's watching to see if the linebackers are disciplined in their scrapes and the corners are where they need to be. Because if you are not, he's going to come back with that same action and then he's going to hit you. He's one who loves tight ends, so he's going to look to exploit the safeties. Although our, 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 the two safeties, Talanao Hufanga, um, coming back, has experience, it's not as though they played the whole year. So he's going to see how disciplined are they going to be to protect the middle of the field, attack the seams first, and then try to take shots when he can. But you, you talked about them going 1-11, and then they, they had the turnaround season. Uh, two years ago, 2017, they had 10 wins. Last year, 12 wins. So this is a team that's on the uptick. Granted, they're breaking in a new quarterback. So look for Tedford to take pressure off of his quarterback by relying on the running game. And, and that was the next point I was going to bring. People see a redshirt senior quarterback making his first start. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure for USC players, eyes light up and, and you want to get after that guy. W what are some of the I, I, maybe pitfalls that, or, or yeah. challenges that come with facing a guy that, I mean, there is almost no film of, and, right. and he is coming in, and, and you know he's, it's one of those things, he's playing with house money, yep. nothing to lose, he's going to come out. What, what are some of the challenges in playing against a guy you just don't know a whole lot about? It's a dangerous proposition to be in, because for one, you look at the lack of experience, less than 15 plays, um, you know, during live game situations, but you cannot account for the amount of time, preparation, the hours that he has spent on the field. So just because he hasn't started or received this opportunity to start doesn't mean that he couldn't come in poised. The worst thing that USC can do is be overly aggressive in trying to jump routes, put themselves in compromising positions, which gives this offense the confidence. This is an offense that's going to predicate itself on momentum drivers, uh, extending plays, trying to gain confidence in the Coliseum. If USC defensively takes the fight to them, and it's not always just defensively, it's how you approach it aggressively offensively too. Establish the running game assert off USC establishing the running game to assert that this is going to be a physical game can oftentimes whatever perception that Fresno State the Bulldogs had coming in you want to keep that edge if you're the Trojans but if you give them a fighter's chance a puncher's chance we've seen he he um, heroic uh, quarterback experiences against USC simply because they gain momentum and I go back years ago when um, when I, I think about Stanford, when Harbaugh brought in a young Stanford team that was like a 29-point dog, and they came in and upset the Trojans. Look for the Trojans to be on top of their game and not take anything for granted. Where does this Fresno State team with, again, we talked about it, very inexperienced quarterback, uh, a running back coming back w with some experience, and then a, a pretty dynamic tight end, wide receivers that were just decimated by departures right. to the NFL and graduation, so a, a ton of fresh faces at yeah. wide receiver. How do they attack this USC defense? Where do you see this USC defense maybe being, being vulnerable against Fresno State? Well, when, when you think about attacking USC defensively, you look at the edges. You want to, if, if you're Jeff Tedford, you, you may want to start off with a little bit of, 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 of multiple sets. You might see some 12 personnel, two tight ends, one running back, maybe perhaps 21 personnel, two, two running backs, one tight end. Different sets to chip the edges. You want to test those edges and see how disciplined, again, those edge rushers from USC are. And then once you, you deliver the inside body blow, now over the last four years, USC has had the privilege of a J.N.A. Harris playing that slot corner position. Now it's a rotation by committee. Perhaps we'll see the likes of a starter like Greg Johnson, Chase Williams, or Raymond Scott in running situations. 
again, those seams are going to be crucial because the best friend of a quarterback is a short pass, like, the, like in, in, in geometry, the hypotenuse. A plus B equals C. Well, this quarterback is trying to go from A to C, and the best way for him to do that is to throw it in a straight line. So look for, uh, for Tedford to initially try to attack the seams with his tight ends, maybe some crossing routes, but often he's also going to test how smart is this USC defensive back. Will they protect the deep ball? If they do, he'll back off. But if they don't, it's going to be wide open. And even if they don't connect early on, look for them in the first 22 scripted plays to take their shots just to see, again, how smart is this USC team? Have they learned from their past uh, mistakes? And, and I want to stick with you on USC defense. What are some things that you're looking forward to? I, I know there's some, some new faces out yeah. there, some old guys stepping up in, into sort of veteran leadership yeah. roles. I, I want to know what you're looking for both kind of just an excitement like I want you know I'd like to do this and, and then what you're really going to be sort of breaking down to see what that might mean going forward yeah. for the rest of the season so there are several question marks at every level um, of this defense that I have question marks regarding one is where's the pass rush going to come from can this front four front five if you will at times manufacture um, a blitz or manu manufacture pressure and take pressure off of the secondary where is that going to come from? Will it come from the likes of a Drake Jackson or um, a Hunter Echoes? Or will we see that from the interior part of the defensive line? More importantly, what's going to happen pre-snap? Will John Houston take over for Cam Smith in terms of being the quarterback on the field? Get everybody lined up, but also get himself in position to make plays. He's a little undersized for a traditional Mike linebacker, so I'm curious, can he withstand playing in between those A-gap tackles? Now you talk about the secondary. That's where it's most intriguing for me because while this is a very talented group and potentially as deep as USC has ever been, Eric, my biggest concern is communication. Can the corners hold up in man coverage? And can the safeties, when needed, come down, check inside the box, and really hold their own and stay healthy? If they can, they'll have success. But again, this defense has the ability of, be, uh, of, of showing multiple fronts going from a, a, a basically like a, a two down lineman and four linebackers to what they call a four three. Four down linemen, three traditional linebackers. And also, will we see the growth and math, maturation of EA? That's gonna be critical for us because if USC is gonna have success, the linebackers are gonna have to be very active. So a lot of question marks, but really it all starts on how well will they play as a cohesive unit and protect themselves against the deep ball. And the last thing, give me a prediction for today. What do you see in terms of how SC plays and then maybe a final score too? Well, I, I'm excited. This is a group that's feeling like they're underdogs that should come into this season rated considering how many four or five star athletes that they have, Eric. But when, when I think about what I'd like to see, I'd like to see explosion on the field. What is Graham Harrell going to do with, when he starts showcasing these new toys that he has? And defensively, can you manufacture in the front the first half of the game enough three and outs to give the offense a second win? So from a, a score standpoint, be very happy if I saw 35 to uh, 15, somewhere in that range, with you know scores coming late from Fresno State. But I like to see a lot of three and outs early, and, and, I, and I definitely like to see USC's offense sustain long drives. All right, that sounds good, Daryl. For Daryl Rodeau, this is Eric McKinney. We are SC.